everyone, uh, welcome. Today we're taking a break from the history of philosophy. As you know, we did, so far we did ancient Greece and Socrates, then we did Plato, then we did Aristotle. Uh, and I thought it would be good to take a break from the history uh, before we move on to the medieval and modern periods in philosophy to do a course on argument analysis and critical thinking. Uh, I'm actually currently tutoring, I believe, four students in a unit uh, called critical thinking, how to analyze arguments and improve your reasoning skills. So uh, they kind of, their questions essentially informed what I would be presenting to you today in this course. Uh, so to the online people, I'm recording this just to make it available to them. Okay, let's go. So what will we be covering today? Firstly, what is an argument? Uh, in philosophy, when I say that's a good argument or that's a flawed argument, uh, that can actually have two meanings. One is the conclusion of the argument, which is the point that it's trying to prove. I have an example here, uh, quote, utilitarianism should be the standard of morality. That is the, uh, the, the meaning one, which is just the conclusion, and that's what I'm trying to prove. Uh, or, and this is the way we will use the term argument in this course, a conclusion supported by one or more premises. So an argument is premises, which are the, the building blocks of the argument supporting the conclusion, which is the final uh, point that the argument is trying to convince you of. And this is an example, probably the most famous example of a deductive argument, which is, quote, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. This is an example actually invented by Aristotle. So it's pretty old. Uh, and it stood the test of time as a good example of what deductive logic looks like. So let's look at the components of an argument. Uh, as I mentioned, argument has premises and a conclusion. Uh, and now, for those of you who want to think back to Aristotle, he did say that there are two aspects of an entity of any kind, form and matter. So the matter in an argument and form and matter apply not just to material things, they can apply to uh, an intellectual uh, entity like an argument, in which case the form, the form would be the logical flow of the premises to reach the conclusion and the matter would be the actual words contained in the premises and the conclusion. Uh, it just goes to show that that whole form matter issue affects, affects everything. So if you, for example, had a, a decorative word like an adjective in an argument, you could easily just take it out it would affect the matter of the argument, wouldn't affect the form. It would still be an argument. <clears throat> um, now, an argument can have one or more premises, but it will always have one main conclusion. It's possible, as you'll see later on, to have complex arguments where it's an argument that depends on another argument, and you can have as many layers of that as you need. Uh, but at each stage, each argument only has one conclusion. The premises, though, can be hypothetically unlimited. Usually, it ranges from one to four. Two is a pretty common number of premises. Uh, so you can just think of them as building blocks. And what do the premises do in relation to the conclusion? They give you reasons and uh, hopefully good reasons to believe the conclusion. Now, these can be uh, absolutely certain. So if you have an argument like, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. If the premises are true, you know for sure that the conclusion will follow. Um, but if you have more complicated cases, for example, you're trying to establish a normative claim, a claim that is uh, saying you should do something or something should be the case, uh, based on only descriptive premises, uh, premises that say that something is the case, then it won't be so straightforward. For example, smoking is bad for you, you therefore you shouldn't smoke. Uh, that's uh, using descriptive claims to prove a normative uh, judgment, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, now, there are two aspects of an argument, validity and truth, and you'll see that on the next slide. These are the two aspects that make an argument valid. Uh, to examine validity, you see if the premises actually give reasons for the conclusion to be believed. So, if we're looking at the validity of the argument, all men are mortal, Socrates is man, Socrates is mortal. You have to ask yourself, is there any possibility where Socrates is not mortal based on those premises? 
Uh, and of course, the conclusion is the final outcome. This might all seem very obvious to you. I'm sure it is, uh, but it will get harder. So I just want this to be crystal clear uh, because we will move on to fallacies and problems in uh, logical reasoning. So it's really important to have this uh, without a shadow of a doubt uh, embedded in your mind. So I mentioned that an argument has two uh, parts to check that it's a sound. A sound argument is one that should be believed, the conclusion of which should be accepted uh, based on the requirements of, of logic and reality. So validity means the premises, if true, logically necessitate the truth of the conclusion. It can't be otherwise. Uh, and it's established what we call analytically. Uh, I don't think the analytic synthetic distinction is a valid one necessarily. But you, those of you who are at all interested in modern philosophy, uh, who learn about, say, uh, the empiricist rationalist debate or about Kant, uh, you'll cover the whole issue of analyticity or uh, the opposite, which would be uh, synth synthetic, but I can't pronounce it, being synthetic, the property of being synthetic. Uh, so what's the difference between the analytic and the synthetic? Well, according to that distinction, uh, an analytic judgment or proposition just means a statement, a sentence of any kind, a claim, uh, an analytic one, you know it to be either true or false just by analyzing the statement itself. You don't have to know anything about the world out there. The synthetic one is one that you can't establish the truth or falsehood of uh, based on just the statement. You have to look at the world. So for example, um, if I were to say Maxim is teaching right now, uh, that would be a synthetic judgment because to know whether that's true or false, you would have to look at the world and see is Maxim teaching or not. But if I were to say one plus one equals two, you wouldn't have to look at the world to know that. You would just have to analyze the meaning of one, the meaning of plus, and the meaning of equals and the meaning of two, and you would see that that is necessitated just by the logic of its own its its own self. In fact. Um, so all you need to know from this for now is that validity can be established without knowing anything about the world. That's what makes it separate from truth. So validity checks that the argument is logical. Truth checks that the argument is actually based on something true. So for example, if I say all polar bears are black, uh, Jack is a polar bear, therefore Jack is black, right? Uh, that would be valid but it would not be true because polar bears are not all black. In fact, they're all white or mostly white. Uh, so that's an example of validity versus truth. Truth, you all are quite familiar with. It's just looking out to the world and making sure that the premises of the argument are in fact true. So is it really true that Socrates is a man? Is it really true that all men are mortal? First, you have to establish those, and then you look at the validity or you can go the other way around, doesn't matter. But both components have to be present uh, for you to decide, yes, the argument is sound, uh, I will accept it. So it's not quite correct to say an argument is true, right? It's also not quite correct to say an argument, well, you, you can say the argument is valid, but that does not mean the same thing as saying the argument is sound. Sound means it's both valid and true, so you should accept it. Another word for sound is cogent. Okay, now we move on to unstated premises. Uh, you'll notice sometimes in an argument, you have a certain assumption built in. And this assumption is required to be made explicit for the argument to flow logically. Sometimes the assumption is so obvious that it's not even worth stating it in normal uh, discussion. Uh, but when we're dealing with just strictly written logical arguments, we always want to make our premises as obvious and explicit and written down as possible. So uh, unstated premise is a premise which is not included in the argument, but which is required to make the argument valid. I've given an example here. Uh, premise P means premise and C means conclusion. So P1, taking narcotics is harmful to health. Taking narcotics leads to addiction. It's premise two. Therefore, conclusion, you should not take narcotics. Now, what's missing? Uh, what's missing is the idea that if it's harmful to health and or leads to addiction, you shouldn't take it. Uh, 
that would have to be included as a third premise for that argument to flow logically. Now you notice when most people speak uh, and make arguments, this sort of thing is implicit. Uh, but you have to make it explicit when you're dealing with this academically uh, or if you're trying to understand what their basic premises are. Okay, that's unstated premises. Now, uh, you don't have to read all that, but this guy is David Hume. He was a Scottish philosopher, an empiricist and a skeptic. And one of the things he's most famous for is what's called the is-ought problem. Uh, it's quite famous. And what he did was he looked at a number of propositions and he divided them into descriptive propositions and normative propositions. So remember descriptive is just, this is the case. It's just a factual claim, whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's claiming that something actually is the case. Uh, whereas a normative claim is something that is saying that something ought to be or ought not to be the case. You should do something or you shouldn't do something. So those ought propositions generally relate to something within human control uh, and, and actually a matter of human choice. So he said, we can't uh, derive, so there's this quote, unbridgeable gap between descriptive statements of how the world is and normative statements of how it ought to be. And this makes it difficult to derive moral values, which is the ought, from the is, from uh, factual observations. So he says, we need a source of justification beyond empirical uh, observation for moral reasoning. And you know there've been a number of propositions as to what that could consist of, uh, most famously uh, by Kant, who was um, in effect responding to Hume. Um, so the idea being you can't infer moral right and wrong from the facts of reality. This is just Hume's idea. I'm not saying it's correct, but uh, indeed, when you do deal with just propositional statements, the logic uh, in this sense, you should make the connection between the is and the ought implicit. So if we go back and you think of my example on narcotics, if you say narcotics are harmful to health, therefore you shouldn't take them, there's a missing link there. You have to say if something's harmful to health, then you shouldn't take it. All right. Uh, just give everyone a second to read that cartoon. So a fallacy is an invalid form of reasoning. It's an attempt to prove something unsuccessfully that isn't supported by logic. So it's a, in effect a, a failure of logic to prove a point uh, or to make an argument. I'm sure uh, whenever there's a conversation between two people and one says, uh, one responds to another's argument, what they're usually trying to show is that the other one's argument contains at least one fallacy of some kind. And indeed, you only need one fallacy to show that an argument uh, is, is invalid. Um, now it says here they can be spoken or written, and they can be used to manipulate or deceive an audience and undermine the credibility and effectiveness of an argument. So uh, we're going to explore what these logical fallacies are. We're going to go through a lot of them, and uh, that will probably equip you to, uh, to avoid them when it's used against you and avoid using them yourself. Um, so that when uh, somebody is arguing with you, you say, that's a red herring, that's a slippery slope, that's a that, you know, and uh, okay. So let's move on. Begging the question. This is a very simple logical fallacy known as circular reasoning. If we go back to this slide here, that's what's going on over here. He's saying graph A is verified by graph B, graph B is verified by graph C, and C is verified by A. Um, I can give you a funny example of this that I heard once. Um, it's it just as a joke. Uh, a person goes to a bank. He says, you should give me a loan. And they say, well, I'd love to give you a loan. The banker says, I'd love to give you a loan, but uh, I don't know that you can repay it. I need to know that you're credible. And he says, all right, well, I'll bring in my friend. So he comes and brings his friend along and he's, uh, and the banker asks the friend, are you, are you credible? Uh, is this friend credible, the one who wants a loan? Uh, the friend says, yes, he's a very credible guy. You can trust him, you can give him the loan. But then the banker thinks and he says, but how do I know the friend is credible? And then the other friend says, well, I can vouch for him. He's been my friend for 10 years. <laughs> okay. So that would be begging the question. It's where the uh, conclusion is itself one of the premises. So it's circular reason. Uh, some famous examples. Uh, I, I must say GPT-4 was really useful in, in writing all this. I, I, I gave it the, the right prompts and it just, it delivered 
excellent uh, examples. But I mean, what's wrong with using it? I, I think gave really genuinely good examples. So, uh, okay, and I prompted it. Uh, you know, make of that what you will. Draw your uh, normative claims. Sorry. Uh, that would be. I don't know what fallacy that is, but you know, one of your premises is wrong. Saying you're a good guy, it's not a guy. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's get to that. So, Bible of the word of, is the word of God because God wrote it. Uh, yep. Ghosts are real. I know this because ghosts told me that they're real. Uh, our team is the best because we always win. This is also equivocation because best and always win is kind of the same thing. Uh, so you are saying we're the best because we're the best. All right. Does everybody get begging the question? This term, by the way, is misused all the time. People say that begs the question. Da da da. That's incorrect. When somebody says, uh, you know, um, I can't think of an example right now, but uh, it doesn't mean makes me want to ask another question. That's not what it means. It, it's a logical fallacy which presupposes the conclusion in the premises. Uh, so next time someone uses it like that, maybe let them know or don't. Depends on whether you want to remain. Uh, friends with them. Okay. Uh, ad hominem, one of my favorite fallacies, involves attacking the person's character directly. And this is really great because you don't have to think very hard. Uh, you just you just attack them. Uh, I've been the victim of this and I have have myself done it as a joke, uh, but highly recommend with friends. Don't recommend in a professional context. Uh, you can't trust John's opinion uh, because he's always a troublemaker and his, has a history of breaking rules. I can't believe Jane is advocating human rights. She's a hypocrite because she eats meat. Uh, we can't listen to Professor Smith's views on climate change. He's a known liberal, and we all know that liberals exaggerate climate, uh, uh, climate problems, environmental problems. So all of these are ad hominem attacks. If anybody cares to suggest another ad hominem attack, that'd be most amusing. Sorry? Uh, yeah, a lot of statements from Trump are indeed ad hominem attacks. That's correct. Um, in fact, a lot of politicians. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, appeal to authority. You should listen to me because I know what I'm, I'm saying and I'm a philosophy teacher and I've done 16 units in philosophy and I did fairly well. That's, a, that's an appeal to authority. Uh, it's not actually giving you any reasons to trust me. Uh, it's just saying that I'm qualified in some way. So Dr. Smith, a world-renowned physicist, says that climate change is a myth, therefore we shouldn't worry about it. Uh, as the CEO of this company, I can tell you that our new product is best on the market. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about because I'm the CEO of this company. Uh, according to the Bible, homosexuality is a sin, therefore we shall sure condemn it. That's also an appeal to authority. In this case, the authority is not an individual, but a thing, namely the Bible or a source. Okay. Uh, this all sounds familiar, right? You you all get what uh, uh, appeal to authority consists of. This is an interesting one. And if I'm being on a slippery slope isn't always a fallacy. Sometimes it's quite valid to, to make this kind of inference, but it can be a fallacy. So it's basically saying if we let X happen, then this much worse thing will happen as, as a result or as a sort of indirect correlate. Um, here's some examples. It's like saying to, you know, if I let my child uh, stay up past their bedtime, then next they'll be staying up two hours past their bedtime and then three hours and so on. Or they'll be asking me for something else that's unreasonable. That's that's the slippery slope fallacy. But in that case, I actually think there's, a, there's some validity to that in the child example. Uh, so th this could be, uh, this could more or less apply to issues open to human choice where, uh, you know, th that's involved. So I'll let my teenager say past midnight. That's just the example I gave. If I buy this expensive watch, I will start spending money on luxury items and eventually go bankrupt. If we are, allow our employees to work from home, they will become less productive and eventually the company will fail. That's not necessarily a slippery slope fallacy uh, because that's actually saying that there's a, a, a link between productivity and working from home, a negative one. You know, that can go either way, it depends on the person, depends on the industry and so on. Uh, but those first two are definitely slippery slope. Okay. Did you have a question, sir?
No, no, okay. Uh, red herring. A herring is a fish. Has nothing to do with a fish, though. Oh, okay, right. It's like throwing a fish to distract a hunting dog. So, a fallacy that occurs when an argument distracts from the main issue by introducing something that is not the main issue. Uh, here are some funny examples. It's amusing, of course, when you know to look for it, and it's obvious when you know to look for it, but I think it's uh, surprising just how many of these logical fallacies kind of get past us on a daily basis uh, when we don't care to critically evaluate them. Uh, during a meeting about budget cuts, one participant suggested reducing funding for a particular department. Another participant responds by talking about how hardworking and dedicated the employees in that department are. So this is this is a very political move, uh, where imagine one politician says, our government is spending way too much money, we need to rein in spending. That candidate uh, is probably right. Now the other candidate says, you, how dare you want to, you know, uh, put all these government employees out of a job uh, or something like that. It's like, no, not, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that the government is spending too much money. Now, there can be many ways to reduce uh, that spending. It doesn't have to include putting thousands of people out of a job. It could, you know, for example, just as an example off the top of my head, include building one fewer submarines or something like that. Um, okay. Um, Here's a really great one, equivocation. People do this all the time, but usually it's more complicated when they, when they do it, so you have to be very careful. People um, uh, use different words to mean the same thing, and they uh, therefore they're in effect begging the question, but by d using different words. So they're, they're saying one meaning, they're equating one meaning with another. So feathers are light. Um, not the best argument GPT-4 gave here. I'm going to have to uh, more carefully read over the examples it provides next time. But I've got an example, including feathers, right? Um, all feathers are light. Things that are light cannot be dark. Therefore, no feathers are dark, right? In the first case, I've used light to mean not heavy. In the other, I use light to mean not dark. Uh, and then you're equating those two, so equivocating. Uh, that shark is dangerous because it has sharp teeth. That's like saying it's dangerous because it's dangerous. Yes? I mean, having sharp teeth kind of automatically makes something dangerous. Uh, so you're saying it's dangerous because it's dangerous. It's not saying it will use those sharp teeth to kill you. Uh, that would be a an actual argument. Yep, here in the third example, you're equivocating life with a journey of a thousand miles. And of course, when you're using metaphors like that, the metaphor only goes so far, and here they're taking it literally. Did I, did I, when did I change that? Sorry. There. Wait, how long ago was that? Just then. Okay, thank you, thank you. I thought it was off the whole time. All right, great. Anyway, next one. Joseph and I joked about this one. Uh, we were saying absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? Is that the one? So yes, so that's that's a very common one given by uh, mystics of any kind, uh, saying just because you haven't seen evidence of it doesn't mean that the evidence doesn't mean that that's evidence that it doesn't exist. Well, actually, it is because you can posit an infinite number of random entities that exist. Uh, and, and, and you say, where's the evidence? I say, I don't need the evidence. You need to provide the evidence that they don't exist. Uh, that's completely invalid. You need some positive evidence to start with. The default should be nothing I can't prove exists, right? So you either have to prove it by seeing it or uh, perceiving it through sense perception, or it can be logically proved from sense perception. That means that any construct in your head is only valid if you can reduce it back down to something uh, that, that can be perceived. That can be a 27-step process, but uh, it, as long as that process can be done, then it's uh, a valid uh, belief. Otherwise, it's not a valid belief. So, um, argument assumes that a lack of evidence for a claim proves that the opposite is true. Yeah, no evidence aliens don't exist, so they must exist. You can substitute God there as well. 
No one has proven that this herbal supplement is harmful, so it must be safe. Uh, no one's proven that my argument isn't corrupt, so they must be corrupt. Here's a good question. How would you prove that an opponent isn't corrupt? You would have to start by getting some claim that they are supported by evidence and then show that the, the evidence is false. But if there's no evidence to say that they are corrupt, you can't actually prove that they aren't. The default assumption should be that they're not corrupt, right? This is like the problem. Um, you'll notice in totalitarian regimes, uh, an individual accused of a crime is always asked to prove that they're innocent without any evidence that they're guilty. Or they, they make up some evidence or whatever. Um, now, how can you prove that you didn't do something? You can say, well, actually, at this time, I have an alibi. I was, you know, here. But you have to have something to work off to make that kind of case definitively. They have to say, no, according to this knife we found with your fingerprints on it, you were, you know, you must have held it between this time and that time, and you were near the, the murder scene and, and so on. Um, and then you can rebut that. But if no evidence is given uh, for the positive, you can't prove the negative. So that is the whole basis for an appeal to ignorance. And this is, uh, this is one that people, this is an argument people always make. And uh, it's, it should just be relegated forever because nothing, uh, uh, you just have to be aware of this kind of fallacy because there's really nothing you can say to prove a negative. Okay, so uh, let's look at the next argument. This is an example of, uh, I won't tell you which one. Oh no, it's already, it's already said there. All right, fallacy of equivocation. So equivocation, again, is using different words or different terms to mean the same thing. Now, if you just heard it initially, somebody saying capital punishment is wrong because the act of putting people to death for their crimes is immoral. Well, that sounds more or less feasible, yes. But this is actually complete equivocation. Because capital punishment is the same thing as putting people to death for their crimes. And in this context, wrong has the same meaning as immoral. So it's just saying capital punishment is immoral because capital punishment is immoral. A is B because A is B. Not valid. Okay. Um, here is an example of a complex argument. So uh, deduction is the idea of getting to, sorry, of knowing a general principle and then applying that general principle to a specific instance to arrive at a conclusion about the specific instance. So the example I gave before, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, that's deductive. Inductive argument, we're not covering here, but I'll just quickly tell you what it is. Inductive argument is the idea that, uh, how do we know, for instance, that all men are mortal? That's an inductive generalization that we have to draw from looking at, uh, I, I think in that context, you could just substitute men for people. So you just look at people and you see, okay, all people die. As a matter of fact, we do observe that all people die. But how do we really know that you know the next person will die and so on? Now, from this kind of objection, some people infer that inductive generalizations are never valid. Uh, never completely valid, never 100% certain. Uh, I don't think that's accurate. I think you can have a certain inductive generalization. Uh, the reason for that is outlined, it wasn't outlined by me, it was outlined by Leonard Peikoff and uh, David Harriman in a book called Induction in Physics. It was an excellent book, um, which maybe we'll cover later on. We will cover Peikoff in our last week, so uh, just wait for then and if we have time then we will mention that but that book is basically about the whole issue of how do we go from all from some to all and how do we make sure that that transition is valid so for example uh, how do we know that we do observe some people are mortal but we can't say any we can't say that about people who have not yet died how do we know for sure that they will die and this book discusses how how in fact we do know and of course it all has to do with understanding the cause of death, understanding what is it in, implicit in the cause that lead up to death that's inescapable and uh, uh, just naturally going to happen anyway, inevitable. Um, so that's induction. 
deduction is much easier because you already have the inductive generalizations. So for example, here in inductive generalizations, all mammals have hair. All S is P, all subject has predicate. The subject is the thing you're talking about. The predicate is the uh, characteristic or property you are ascribing to the subject. So hair is the predicate or having hair is the predicate. Mammals are the subject. So we go, uh, all mammals have hair, whales are mammals. And then we have a conclusion, therefore whales have hair. Now this conclusion actually functions as a premise in the next argument. So we know that whales have hair from the preceding argument. Then we say, all creatures with hair are warm-blooded. So then we know that whales are warm-blooded. And then that's a conclusion which serves as a premise to the next argument. Uh, if, if whales are warm-blooded and warm-blooded creatures can maintain a stable internal temperature in cold water, then whales can maintain that stable internal temperature in cold water. Right? So you can just keep going and going. And this is just the whole idea of a complex argument. A complex argument is made up of two or more uh, sub-arguments. Right? Uh, now, it's possible to have a sub-argument plus one other premise leading to the main argument, or you can have sub, you know, you can go however you like. But as long as you've got one extra argument that, that the main argument depends on, then it's considered a complex argument. Ah, now this is very interesting. This is not really uh, directly connected with the critical thinking unit, for those uh, who are doing that one, but... I, I thought it was interesting to include it. Uh, whenever you're looking at an argument made by someone or some book or whatever, uh, it's really important to distinguish what is really essential to the argument from what is not. If you uh, remember back to Aristotle, we discussed accidental versus essential properties. And the essential property is some characteristic without which the entity wouldn't be what it is. For instance, Without the faculty of uh, reason, I would not be who I am. If I was suddenly made uh, incapable of reasoning of any kind, uh, I, would, I would just be literally like a vegetable, right? I would be unable to, to do anything. Uh, and at that point, I will have lost my essence. Um, very unlikely to happen, but you know, <laughs> that's what would be required for uh, the essence uh, to be lost in, 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 in me, for instance. Uh, or uh, let's say a table would lose its essence if it were no longer a flat surface uh, with supports. So if it were say uh, broken in many pieces, right? Then it would lose its essence. But you have non-essentials as well. I would still be the same me if I cut off all my hair or uh, you know came dressed in a different suit or whatever it was. So the same thing applies to arguments. Essential features of an argument I refer to the underlying principles or values that form the foundation of the argument. Non-essential features are superficial characteristics. So here I thought of a case like Robin Hood. People sometimes use Robin Hood as this great socialist example of the one who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Now, I don't think that's really essential to the, the whole character of Robin Hood because what's essential is he was living in feudal I don't know if it was England or something, right? He was, he lived, or maybe it was France. I, where is Robin? England. Okay, thank you. So he lived in feudal England, which is not exactly a free society, where uh, the poor peasants were oppressed by these, um, uh, what were they called? Basically landowners, but they had all this power, direct power to violate the rights of the peasants. The peasants, in fact, had no rights. They weren't able to own their own land or you know, whatever arrangement was there was not a, an arrangement reached by completely free, uncoerced people. Um, and what he was doing was he was taking the, the money and the goods that were expropriated by force uh, by these feudal lords from the peasants and returning it to the peasants. This is the principle here is not taking from the rich and giving to the poor. That's just an, that's an accident. It could have been the other way around. The point is he was practicing the principle of justice, returning that which is owed, uh, and, and taking that which is not earned, taking goods that are unearned from those who have not earned them and returning it to their rightful owners. Uh, so that's an example of essentials versus non-essentials. So this is really worth knowing. It applies to any argument. Ah, it's a shame I just did this before the slide came up, but. Um, all right, quickly, inductive versus deductive reasoning. 
Again, induction is drawing a general conclusion based on observation of many, many instances. But what it doesn't mention here is that you have to understand the source of the instances. You have to understand why are all swans white? And if you really understand that, you'll know, actually, wait a second, there's nothing about the nature of a swan that means it has to be white. And that's why there are, in fact, black swans. Um, but there is something, as far as I can tell, uh, in the nature of humans that makes us mortal. Whether that can be changed through science is still open uh, an open question. But if, say, uh, the characteristic of mortality were taken from humans by, say, the advent of medicine or whatever it is, whatever scientific advancement, I would say that that is a, an, an essential change you know, in what we are. Then again, this is just sort of me deliberating out loud. But maybe mortality isn't really an essential characteristic of being human. I would say something like rationality is. But I wouldn't call it inhuman or not non-human to live for as long as you wanted. Anyway, next point. Okay. So uh, we've gone through some basic aspects of argument. We've gone through logical fallacies. Uh, yeah, sure, you can ask a question. Yeah. Could you elaborate on this essential or non essential part? Like, I would like to take it step more back forward. Yep, one second, one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you want me to go back to. That one? Yes. Yep. What about it? Sure. Um, let's say you're hearing a, an argument that's, well, just an argument of any kind, right? Uh, now, take a very simple argument. Uh, like that Socrates one. That only contains essentials. There's nothing in that argument that is that can be removed for it to be, like literally every single word is required for the argument to flow, right? That's essentials. But if you say, um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a wise philosophical man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The fact that he's wise and philosophical is non-essential, right? Uh, we've gone through the technical elements so far. I just want to go through some general tips on actually arguing with people. Uh, the first thing is it's generally completely a waste of time and just not worth doing. I, uh, I discovered this a few weeks ago. I rediscovered this fact a few weeks ago uh, when, <laughs> when uh, you and Stephanie debated me on various matters of religion, and uh, we all emerged just with more firmly entrenched positions and better reasons to support them, which I guess is a, is a plus on the, 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 the having better reasons. But um, you just have to go in with the understanding that your chance of actually changing someone's mind is close to zero. Mm -hmm. Or change someone else's mind. Or do argue because I want to understand the topic that, That's a valid reason to argue, right? If you're uh, just trying to understand someone's position better, that's fine. You can do that because they will tell you their whole position if you just ask enough questions. Um, so if I tell you, like, when I have like, a debate or an argument, so yeah. like, I'm not necessarily trying to convince them that I'm right. I'm trying to understand the topic as a whole, and then I might like change my idea. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's absolutely worth arguing if you're not sure on the issue. Uh, like, if you're if you're yourself open to changing your mind and someone says something you think is valid, that's a good reason. So uh, what I mean by argument though is back and forth uh, where you're trying to prove the point, you know? Uh, okay, so if you wanna be intellectually honest when you debate, which most people don't, so just set that aside and you don't wanna debate those people. But let's say you're, you're debating with your, your philosopher friend or you're debating um, a technical issue, something where actually a right answer is, is, is pretty clear. Uh, with someone, firstly, you want to define your terms. You want to make sure you're actually discussing the same thing. 
So define the terms clearly and precisely to avoid any ambiguity or equivocation. So equivocation is using different words to mean the same thing, uh, or you can do the opposite where you're using the same word, meaning different things. Uh, ambiguity is, of course, uh, lack of clarity in what the meaning of words is. Okay, identify and challenge contradictions. A contradiction is a statement that is either um, impossible by its own logic or two separate statements that contradict one another. Uh, for example, if I say all A's are B's, and then I say no A's are B's, not possible, right? Um, or if I say A is B, and then I say A is not B, that's a contradiction. Okay, stay focused on essentials. We've just covered this in the essentials to non-essentials issue. Uh, if I said all men are mortal, Socrates is a wise philosophical man, the adjectives wise and philosophical are not essential to the issue. Uh, and then if I say, therefore Socrates is mortal, somebody else jumps in and says, oh no, Socrates wasn't really that wise. It's like, well, that doesn't matter. It's still, my point is just that he's mortal. Uh, so if you yourself are trying to advance a point, you don't want to say, Socrates is a wise philosophical man, because then you are introducing all these non-essential factors which they can rebut and which will weaken your uh, indisputable main point, which is just that he is mortal. Um, so, for example, if you say, uh, uh, what's a good example? I don't know. Socialism is dictatorial and inefficient. I actually can't, I actually can't tell which of those is non-essential. They're both true. Uh, the inefficient, you know, some economists will say, oh, but look at the inefficiency of some other market mechanism. It's like, all right, fine. The essential is it's dictatorial. It tells you what to do. It enslaves you, it forces you to work, it, it, et cetera. All right. Uh, so apply the principle of non-contradiction. This is the Aristotelian principle that contradictory propositions cannot both be true at the same time. Mutually exclusive propositions cannot both be true at the same time in the same sense. Same thing as uh, contradiction. You can't say it's false because then you're ruling out the fact that it's not true, which is just affirming the principle of non-contradiction, right? Does everyone get that? Yep. Reaffirmation through denial. That's how you know you're dealing with an axiom. You can't uh, say that contradictions exist because then you're saying that they don't not exist. You're ruling out the opposite, which is actually what non-contradiction requires. Okay, this is obvious. Appeal to reason and evidence uh, rather than emotion or a personal opinion. This doesn't mean you can't be passionate in your argument. It just means that the passion has to follow the reason rather than lead. Uh, you can speak with passion and make jokes and all of that. That's fine. Uh, as long as you're primarily uh, using uh, reason and you're not letting the emotion contaminate the reason. So uh, be logical in your words and expressive in your delivery if you wish to be. But that depends on your audience and the context and all that. Uh, avoid ad hominem attacks. Even though they're really fun, I would, I would avoid it unless you're with a friend. Okay. These are my tips. Uh, yeah, if, unless they're intellectually honest, don't try to convince them. Because what does it mean to be intellectually honest? It means an intellectually honest person is actually looking for reasons why, like they're really listening to your reasons and they're just saying, uh, these are the reasons I've given, these are the counter reasons or objections or whatever you've given. And we're just gonna consider them as standalone statements it doesn't matter who said what, it matters what is true. That's all. Uh, that's intellectual honesty. Uh, if they are retreating uh, and rationalizing, which means that, for example, they say the state should be run. Uh, oh, somehow, I'm just, I just have no examples in my head today. Um, all right, let's, let's just move on. So, um, you have to understand as I have learned, that some people actually take their views so personally and they're unable to dissociate their ego from their views that they actually get really offended when they're challenged. Uh, and as amusing as this can be to witness in a person you despise, it's not conducive to a healthy relationship. Uh, so I would avoid it if you at all care about uh, continuing uh, your interactions with that individual. It's better to let people arrive at their own conclusions slower uh, 
But if your goal, if you're debating them publicly and your goal is to just embarrass them, <laughs> not that that should be your goal, but if that's your little side goal, uh, then then go go for it, go in for the kill. Um, okay, so check whether the uh, disagreement is over content and not the meaning of terms. That's what I said about define your terms. Uh, now this is really important. Okay, um, jokes aside, this second last point is really important. Uh, you have to understand what are the basic ideas on which they're basing everything they say. And if you can get to the really, really root cause of it, you can just be like, well, we disagree at this level, and this level is very fundamental. And usually, uh, if you're good at this, you find a single thing on which their entire argument hinges, and which you can just say, you just you just pull that out, and it's like a Jenga tower, it just falls over. Uh, for example, uh, if you observe our political debates on Q&A and all these other platforms and so on uh, about the role of the state and you've got the liberal politicians and the labor politicians and the greens and the one nations and whatever right and they're all debating with each other about what the government should and shouldn't do uh, what laws we should and shouldn't have you'll notice that it seems to the, the one thing they all have in common is that the state should have quite a lot of control over people's lives they just disagree on what controls it should have specifically and how it should use those controls. But they're always talking about how to spend public money. None of them are opposed to the whole principle of public money. None of them are saying it's wrong that individual product, uh, producers have their wealth that they created taken from them by force to be given and spent in whichever way these politicians decide against the will of the uh, population uh, or, you know, with the majority consent but not with the consent of whose money it actually is right um whether you disagree with whether you disagree with me or not is, is irrelevant maybe you think the state has a, a, a more active role in the economy that's fine but you'll notice that i'm just trying to illustrate the point that this is the basic thing they all accept and all you have to do is say what if that's wrong what if you don't really like this whole mechanism isn't required um anyway any questions on that point? Okay, good. Oh, um, I forgot to break these up by uh, example and then the answer. So you guys are just gonna have to look selectively. Uh, you're gonna have to close your eyes to reality. Uh, okay, spot the fallacy. Either we ban all plastics or our environment is destroyed, right? Here you have a false dichotomy. Some of these fallacies we haven't covered. So false dichotomy means it's got to be one or the other. Uh, and if it's not one, it'll be this other terrible thing, right? Either you come to my philosophy courses or you'll be stupid and ignorant for the rest of your life. Uh, that's a um, false dilemma, false dichotomy. We should not trust the scientific consensus on climate change. After all, the scientists once believed the Earth was flat. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never actually encountered that fallacy. Okay, based on its origin or history. But this is basically the opposite of an appeal to authority. It's saying it's a, it's like a, that the argument appeals to disauthority. Right? It's saying that the that science you, science can't be trusted because sometimes science is wrong or science was wrong in the past. Uh, it's also really important, I think, in, in general, to distinguish science from what scientists say. Uh, science is a method of discovering the facts of reality, right? And it, it has, it's, it's a method which can be properly applied or improperly applied. Uh, the method doesn't guarantee that at every point it will have the correct conclusions, especially when you have an early developing science you will uh, develop theories and then you'll find data that contradict the theories and you'll have to adjust or completely reconfigure the theories. Uh, so, but still, it's not the case that uh, trusting science is very different to trusting specific scientists. And it's worth, of course, noting that uh, scientists, if they're being intellectually honest, will always have disagreements between them. Uh, okay. Why should we believe climate science about global warning? warming? They just want more funding for their research. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not, not bad, but still, ad hominem, it's saying that it's assuming some kind of negative motivation. Could be true, could be false. Um, he can't be a good leader. Good leaders are charismatic, and he is introverted. Again, uh, 
no true Scotsman fallacy. Is that what it's called? Right. Right. Okay. So it's basically saying that charisma is somehow the opposite of introversion. Okay. Now, uh, now here are harder ones. I specifically got harder ones, mate. Um, No, it actually said Scotsman. I I don't know. I you know. Uh, but I guess it would have several names. Basically, in that in that instance, it was just talking about introversion being somehow the opposite of charisma. So that was a, that was the fallacy. It's like an anti-equivocation. Okay, our government's fiscal policies must be working because the stock market has been performing so well. Well, it's effectively saying that the stock market is determined only by how well the fiscal policies are working, not by everything else that goes on in the, in the uh, economy. Society must reject the use of AI in any context. It's very ironic because this was written by AI. AI could potentially become sentient and pose a threat to humanity. Um, slippery slope, yep. Anyway, you guys get the point. I won't go through the others. Okay. All right. Uh, argument analysis. So this is where you get a complex argument, which is the main argument, and then you have a sub-argument on which that uh, main argument depends. So if we fail to educate our young people about the importance of voting, they are unlikely to vote. A democratic society depends on engaged citizenry, thus not engaging young people about voting uh, threatens democracy. Okay, so in standard form, What's the conclusion of the argument? The argument, the conclusion is the point that the argument is trying to prove. Very good reading off the slide. Excellent. Uh, so what's the sub argument? Yep. And then, well, the argument is that that causes them not to vote. And that, uh, yeah, okay. Now, um, I haven't yet covered the difference between codependent and independent premises. Uh, for example, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, those are codependent. The premises, all men, um, all men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, the, the term is men that they have in common, or man, right? They have in common, so those are dependent. And when you draw them as a diagram, they would go like this, and then together they would lead to the conclusion at the top. Uh, if you have independent premises, that would be an, ex an example of that would be the one I gave earlier, which is uh, narcotics are harmful to health, narcotics are addictive. These are separate reasons for why you shouldn't take narcotics. So they would, they would be diagonal lines. I, I haven't got a diagram here, but uh, I think you've seen these argument maps before, right? They look like uh, decision trees or family trees. Yep. And at the top you have the conclusion. That's like the main point that's being proven. Okay, here you've got the question on the left, so you just have to selectively ignore the information on the right. Uh, smoking should be banned in public places because it harms the threat of uh, harms the health of others. Secondhand smoke is nearly as harmful as smoking itself. So, it says because it harms the health of others. Yep. Mm hmm. Everybody gets that? So the sub argument is that smoking harms the health of others. And, se and secondhand smoke is nearly as harmful as smoking itself. And you'll notice how the premises work. So the premises that support the main conclusion would be that it harms the health of others and it's nearly as harmful as smoking itself. Yeah, this could have been improved a bit as an argument. It's not quite long enough. But okay, does everyone get the get the general idea? Yep. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, I'll take questions.